Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Simon Ramshaw, a uh, rather husky voice, so apologies for that. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of UK-based Aconia Lasers Limited. And as most of you know, we're actually a subsidiary organization of Acona Corporation, um, who are based in Florida, and we look after their interests for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, throughout this lockdown period, we've been running plenty of educational webinars, which we hope uh, a lot of you have found helpful. If you weren't able to actually get on the webinars or um, you haven't um, got around to watching them yet, or you've lost the email with them, uh, let us know. And we have a spreadsheet with links to the webinars that we've run, and you can watch them in your own time. Uh, thank you again for joining. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Um, this webinar is being run by uh, Mr. Robert Sil uh, Sullivan from Middleton Laser Clinic in Ireland, and Dr. Jake Cook from the Neuromuscular Clinic in Woking. And the title is Assessing and Treating Chronic Pain, a Case Study of Chiropractic Treatment with True Non-Thermal Laser. And we'll explain a little bit later on about what we mean by true. Um, we'll obviously be happy, all three of us, to answer any questions that you have at the end of the webinar. And you'll notice down the right hand side, you'll see a questions panel. Um, if you'd like to put your questions throughout the duration of the webinar, and then by the time it's finished, um, we'll, um, we'll address those questions and pass them on to either Rob, Jake, or myself with the, uh, the answers. So without further ado, I would like to pass across to Jake and Rob. Um, they've got extremely impressive resumes between them. Um, and I'd like them to explain in their own words a little bit about themselves and why they got involved with laser. So I will pass across to you first, Jake, if you don't mind, please. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Simon. So uh, I'm a chiropractor. I have a special interest in neurology, uh, in particular, how do we control movement, balance, posture, and pain? So I first came across um, lasers and, and the iconia laser in particular when I had a, a patient with just horrendous, uh, horrendous widespread body pain. Um, and her, her history was that everything had failed. So any, anybody who touched it pretty much made it worse. Um, and so she got in touch and said, you know, I've heard that these, these lasers can be effective. Have you got any experience with that? And I, I didn't. So I went to do some research and that kind of led me down this path to, to where I am now. I think that uh, one of the best ways to learn is to go through real cases. So that's what I've tried to do for today. We're going through a, a case of uh, chronic severe hip pain that spread to be a whole body widespread pain. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that happens, how to assess for whether there's central changes uh, or central uh, pain sensitization, and then where I start uh, in that case with treatment. Um, if you have any questions, feel, let me, feel free to let me know. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll pass over to Rob. Thank you very much. So I am going to scare you guys by sticking my ugly mug on the screen. Um, some of you might know me, some of you may not. Uh, my name's Robert Sullivan. I am, a, I'm not an airline pilot. I'm a reconstructive uh, orthopedic podiatrist. Um, for the last, I think, 20 odd years. Um, my introduction to Aconia was quite strange. Uh, I was involved in education and research at the time. I was dean of one of the uh, institutional faculties and um, Aconia were presenting uh, a laser at the time and I asked to see the research. What I ended up doing is proving that non-thermal low level laser really does work. As a podiatrist, you're kind of thinking, well, what do I know about pain? Um, I have very much expanded my, my scope of practice. Um, my scope of practice now used to include um, joint replacements as far as the, the hip um, and lots of other things in relation to pain. I've gone back, I've studied neurology, uh, I've done pain management. So pretty much a lot of what I do now in my clinic involves some podiatry and a lot of pain management and low-level lasers. So um, I would treat 
pretty much any patient for anything that comes along with a laser. I've gone from being a surgeon who would have done 450, 500 operations a year to a surgeon who now probably does around about 10, maybe 12, just enough to keep my clinical skills. And the patients I only operate on now are patients that actually need uh, to be operated on. So I am going to run through the science behind this uh, and then hand you over to Jake. And because we're talking specifically here about pain, um, I'm going to give you a little uh, bit of an insight in what a podiatrist uh, or a reconstructive orthopedic podiatrist knows about pain. Uh, at any stage during this, I'm going to invite Jake or, or Simon to, to, to butt in, even ask questions as we go along, because I think if you have something that's pressing and you stick it on the screen and the guys want to shout it out, then they can, or if they want to talk to me about what I'm saying, then that would be good also. So. As always, from the top, we are talking about pain. And um, pain is one of the things that our body uses to tell us that something is wrong. And as we all know, there can be many types of pain. So then we're gonna look at what happens when things go wrong. Uh, and that means in terms of, sometimes we will experience a pain uh, uh basically in the, through no susception and occasionally that pain can begin to sort of go strange go wrong and and wind up so we're going to have a look at a little bit of what happens there then i'm going to hand across to jake's presentation his his video presentation uh, and then when he's finished that we're going to come back and we're going to look at conclusions and the conclusion we're going to really talk about at this time is, is everything as simple as it actually seems? And in reality, it it is. The kind of lasers that we're looking at today, uh, which Jake is using, is this one. Um, it's an Aconia laser. It's a, a true non-thermal low-level laser. Um, what we mean by true uh, non-thermal low-level laser, as opposed to low-level laser, which confuses a lot of people, is this is a true laser. It is columnated, it is monochromatic, it is unidirectional, everything is in phase, frequency, etc. Um, and a lot of what we would see out there pushed as lasers aren't actually lasers, they are LEDs. And the confusing point about it is both are measured in, in nanometers, both are measured in uh, hertz of energy. But when we talk about this kind of true non-thermal low-level laser, we're talking about a laser that can only be non-thermal because a, a laser that's designed as a cold laser can be hot and a hot laser like I would use in surgery can be cold. This baby can only be cold. So, pain. As we all know, we've all experienced it at some stage, pain is an unpleasant sensation and it can be anything from just a little bit uncomfortable to, oh God, that's really painful. Um, pain in most people will always evoke an emotional response. So if you stick your finger on the hot ring of your cooker, it will uh, provoke an emotional response, usually um, concluded with a number of expletives. Um, Pain is usually linked to some kind of damage. So if I've stuck my finger on the hob, I'm gonna have a burn, that's that's damage. If I'm running and I fall, that's damage. If I twist and strain, that's damage. And usually it, a lot of this is tissue damage, unless of course, you know, we, we snap and break something. Pain is something that also allows our body to do something else. It allow, allows our body to react in a particular way that helps us to prevent further damage of that area and also to try and present, uh, prevent damage of another area. And as we know, the experience of pain is extremely different for everybody. So, you know, I sometimes say with my patients, you know, they will say I'm doing a particular procedure with them. They will say, is this going to hurt? If it's a man, I tell them, yeah, this is really gonna hurt. If it's a woman, I would say this is not going to be so painful because research tells us that men experience pain far differently to how women experience pain. So moving on, we have types of pain. First type of pain is what we would call acute pain. And 
it's it it can be quite extreme pain but it doesn't really last for too long um, it can last for a number of days going into a week or so and it very much tells us that we have injured something we have damaged some tissue and it makes the person aware of that and this is where we run into dangers when it comes to uh, diabetic patients who sustain neuropathies and things like that because they don't get that localized alert and that's why we see compounded and complex uh, tissue damage so acute pain also triggers the body's flight or fight response you know i've stuck my hand on the halogen hob i'm not going to do it again uh, and i'm really going to get away from that and it will create a response an emotional response around that so treating the underlying injury the burn in this case will usually help to uh, resolve that acute pain so in this category of acute pain we have deviations of this we kind of have this um, somatic pain we would have visceral pain and then we have uh, what we all love referred pain so this somatic pain is really a, a superficial pain uh, usually on the skin or in the soft tissue or just below the, the skin itself um, the visceral pain really originates in organs linings of internal cavities etc there are definitions of how people would experience this pain. And then referred pain is pain that we feel, but the location is different. And sometimes this is to do, is, is to do with our proprioception and, and again, how we perceive it. So the example that I've given here is uh, the shoulder. You would get a pain in your shoulder during a heart attack and that pain can radiate down the arm. So, Next type of pain is chronic. Chronic pain lasts for a lot longer. Um, often with chronic pain, I would have said there is no cure. Now I say maybe, um, possibly, probably a cure. Um, it can be mild or it can be severe, but in all of these, it is continuous or intermittent. So it can go away. It can come back, it can go away, it can come back. It's the kind of thing that nags. Uh, so in some circumstances, what will happen here is the sympathetic nervous system adapts to uh, the pain itself and the stimulus that's causing it. And that can build up pretty much electrical signaling within our central nervous system. And that basically leads to overstimulation of nerve fibers. And that creates pretty much the wind up effect that you guys as chiropractors will know. Um, the interesting thing about all of this is when I trained first, chiropractors would have been something that I would have ran away from, um, I would have shied away from. But I think over the last, especially since my association with Aconia, over the last 10 years, chiropractors, you guys have taught me so much. Um, I now understand the nervous system in ways that I never understood from medical school. Um, I now appreciate pretty much the way that things work and I very much see the value of multidiscipline in teams. So Sorry, before you move on, do you mind if I uh, do you mind if I jump in? Sure. So in terms of acute, subacute and chronic, traditionally we've always used those as a description of time. So acute is just you know a couple of weeks and chronic is over a few months. The problem with that description is clinically it's misleading. So patients will come in and will say, oh, you've, you've let's say they have a whiplash and we'll say, oh, you know, it only happened yesterday, it's just acute. Um, and then we just wait to see if it gets better or not. And when it doesn't get better, we then say, oh, well, you know, it's been three months, now you've got chronic pain. The population as a whole know that chronic pain is bad. I've had, and I'm sure you have as well, had many patients in the past say, can we just get on top of this? I don't want it to become chronic. Where those descriptions are misleading is the severity of the injury initially is the start of the chronic pain. So if you have someone who has a car crash and they have a whiplash, if that injury is severe enough, within hours, you already start to see on a neurological level changes uh, that are the building blocks for chronic pain. And that goes the same for any injury. So, you know, someone who 
has a mild sprain, maybe not so much, but someone who has a, uh, let's say, a traumatic shoulder dislocation that was very scary, let's say skiing, they thought they were going to fall off the edge of a cliff and they managed to catch themselves on a tree. Within a few hours, you already start to see those changes. Um, and in terms of treatment, you need to take that into account. Research shows that if you can intervene early on and stop, you know, get, in, get involved as soon as possible, you can prevent those chronic changes or, or hopefully limit them. Um, there was an interesting study where they, a chiropractic study, um, um, sorry, not a chiropractic study, I, I lied there. It was a, a study where they had car crash patients. Um, and basically, if they in, managed to get an injection into the joint that receives whiplash uh, within the first few hours, there was virtually no pain the next day. If they waited a day or two, the patients developed chronic pain. So it's important when you're looking at patients not just to think how long has it been, but really ask around what, what was the mechanism, mechanism of injury and what are the chances this is going to go on to become chronic or already is becoming chronic and change your treatment plan appropriately. Right. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Um, you have saved me probably the next two slides, um, which is great um, because I was also going to say you will have patients, I have patients that present and they will tell me that they're acute and you look at them and you take the etiology, the development of their condition, or you take actually how it happened. And you know that that term chronic is, is actually not true. Like this is an acute situation. Um, sorry, this is an, uh, it's not true that it's acute. It's a chronic situation in, in development. And I think like Jake said there, the earlier we intervene in something like that, the better, because like, uh, one of the presentations I, I did recently uh, showed you a patient that, of mine that we had that had a whiplash and she came in telling me that, you know, this was acute because she only did it yesterday. So we automatically, when I assessed that, I looked at it and I said, okay, we're not going to treat this as a an acute situation. We're going to begin and treat this as a chronic situation. So that's an excellent point from Jake and something well worth remembering. Um, when we look at pain descriptions, again, I'm, I'm, when I've, I finish with these slides, I'm going to turn all of this on its ear anyway. So when we look at pain descriptions, you know, we look at nociceptive pain, we look at visceral pain, we look at all the pains that we've mentioned there, and we have all the explanations for each of those pains. All of those explanations, in my view, are very valid when I am teaching you uh, as uh, not you guys, but when I'm teaching students, all of these things are valid because it helps them to understand pain um, and it helps them to understand the method of action of this pain. But what we're talking about here is scientific definitions and scientific descriptions of pain. And the important thing to remember, and I've kind of learned this over the years as a clinician, the important thing to remember is our body doesn't experience nociceptive pain, visceral pain, um, somatic pain, neuropathic pain. Our body experiences pain. It experiences pain in, in different differing degrees, but our body particularly doesn't exactly know what type of, of pain that is. It just knows it's pain and that it's there because our body is very much something that functions as a total unit in this particular time in this particular space. Our body has no awareness of what that pain will be like in five seconds time or what it was like five seconds before that because it's a, a moment by moment moment thing. So we have these definitions of pain in order to help us classify something and in order to tell us what nerve or potential state we need to treat in relation uh, to that pain. So what I want to look at briefly, and, and, and Jake, again, you, you would be far better at this than I would. You know, what we want to look at now is what happens when things go wrong. I did a big troll of the, the research behind this to have a look at it. And the one guy that I came up with was this wolf guy. Um, and you can see what he's basically saying there, activation of the limbic, ba ba ba, and all of this. And like, what we forget when we look at pain is we actually forget that we actually forget what's happening. We sometimes are so preoccupied with the pain that we forget the patient. And I think when, when we look at a statement like what we have there, we can pretty much see what we need to do. We need to start looking at the patient, stepping back. And 
we don't just look at the patient in terms of pain. We look at the effect this pain has on the system. Does it change the way they walk, the way they sit? Does it change the posture? Does it change what it changes? And all of these are very much indications into the treatments that we, we need to give. So this, this basic thing of when things go wrong, this basically in, includes really in this increased um, I suppose increased synaptic e efficacy really, uh, which means that when things go wrong, everything else hurts, things are more triggered. So if we take a pain um, that's a small pain, that pain can become a big pain if it isn't treated, because basically the synaptic efficacy of that will begin to trigger other things. Um, we would see increases in uh, neuromodulatory cells. We would basically see more transcription in, in genes. And we would also see, and a lot of time we forget this, and this to me is very important, it's fundamental to pain. We would also forget that there is an immune system response which is directly impacted by this chronic pain. And I think these are very, very much important things to remember, especially when you have a tool like this, because you have something that basically triggers the chemical process within our body to treat not just pain, but to pretty much treat our immune system as well. Because as far as I'm concerned, our bodies contain everything we need to fix themselves. We just sometimes lack the energy to do it. This device is the energy, and that's why it's so effective across so many things, because the laser itself is purely a delivery system for the energy that our body needs in order to repair itself. So the other thing that we see when things go wrong is we see increased receptor field size and density. Um, and all of this will basically lead on to more sensitivity within the nervous system. Um, and it makes it a little bit more difficult for the body itself to detect where this, this, this stimulus is coming. Um, and of course, a lot of this will go on for a long time. And Jake is going to talk about this a lot better than I can. So I'm gonna click on this link. It's going to take you to Jake's video. Hopefully what I've said around it will help into this and Jake and I will come back and talk to you afterwards. So question, how do you know when central pain sensitization is occurring? So just the thought we have to say central pain sensitization every time, let's call it CPS. So how do you know when CPS is occurring? And what is it in the history that tells you? What is it in your physical exam that tells you? So to answer that question, I thought we'd go through a case. So this is a real case. This is the last new patient I saw before the lockdown started. Unfortunately, she has a terrible uh, case of asthma as well. Um, so not only was she my, my last new patient, she was also the first one I had to tell not to come back. Um, but it's a really good case to go through. So it's a 54-year-old woman who presented with chronic, severe left hip pain. She was born with congenital hip dysplasia, or she described it congenital hip dislocation. So she's always had hip problems, she's always had hip pain. But she's tough and she's modeled through. However, when she gave birth to her first child, things started to get worse. She had a second child fairly quickly after, um, and about 14 months later, gave birth the second time. And at that point, I think really started to cause severe daily pain, chronic. Yeah, chronic daily pain. Um, follow exams, we had an x-ray and bone scan showed severe osteoporosis, and it was recommended that uh, in her late 40s that she would have a, uh, not late 40s, in her 40s that she'd have total weight replacement. So obviously quite severe. She says that for the first two or three months, actually the pain was better. Not gone, not a cure, but better than it was. Unfortunately, this poor woman was in an abusive relationship. So we won't go into details of that, but imagine all the stress and all the horrible stuff that you know that does to, to, to the brain and body. Um, and then she fell and slipped on some ice, landing hard on her on her low back. Now the hip surgery was complete success. The surgeon was really happy with it, and when she fell, she didn't damage that hip at all.
that left hip, in the anterior hip, that's where the pain always was, but in the posterior buttock as well. After the second birth, that pain started to spread down her leg, going all the way down to her ankle. Um, once she fell, she hurt her back, then that you know, low, the central low back, um, and then the pain started mirroring her left leg, started spreading down her right leg. This pain down in the ankle is unfortunately because her, her movement balance and posture is so affected, she falls a lot. She said that she falls almost daily. And when she fell, she managed to rupture her right Achilles ankle, Achilles tendon. Um, the pain then started to spread from her low back up into her you know, upper lumbar, lower thoracic. It then jumped up to her neck, across the shoulders, and down to the, down to the arms. So in terms of what do you see when you're looking at a history of, of CPS, a chronic pain, that's kind of it. Pain that starts in one place and then generally will follow the dermatome down, um, you know, follow that dermatome down into the, into the limb. Um, as the pain gets worse, it may start to mirror. So if we were to say, I hurt my, my left shoulder, let's say I've got a supraspinatus strain. We will always get primary sensitization in injured tissue. That always occurs. So by primary sensitization, we mean that when we touch, it's more painful than someone that's not injured. Pain pressure thresholds. So if I poke myself in the chest, I can poke pretty hard without really reporting any discomfort there, any pain. If I sprain my supraspinatus, what we'll see is, you know, with much less touch, I'm more likely to say that's painful. And you're going to see that in any injured tissue. That's not a problem. That peripheral sensitization is part of the healing process. You know, these little nerves become more sensitive to say, lay off me. You know, I'm repairing this part, don't hurt. The secondary hyperalgesia, which is an indication of central of CPS, starts to occur, or we know it's occurring, when tissues adjacent to the injured tissue, so non-injured tissues, start to hurt. So I injure my supraspinatus, but now actually when you start to poke around infraspinatus, that actually really hurts too. Maybe um, maybe you don't know, the, the lateral part of the shoulder is painful. Maybe you start to see the biceps actually when you squeeze that, that's really painful. So generally it's going to affect areas that are of the same dermatome. So if it's five, six, anything that is um, you know, receiving that five, six is going to hurt too. And then it will start to spread down the spinal cord. So that's that central, that CPS. I'm telling myself I want to use that CVS and yet I keep trying to see the tongue twister. So if you think of um, your segmental levels, you know, obviously five, six, seven. So the pain starts to spread inferiorly normally. So that means the patient will say, yeah, originally let's say the pain was in five, then it started to go down to six, now it's starting to go into seven, eight. So the patient basically will say, yeah, what's just my shoulder? Actually, now I feel it quite a lot in my hand. And when you, you can identify that by doing your, your uh, pain pressure thresholds in that same area. So really, this shouldn't hurt, right? Not really. Might a little bit tender, but it shouldn't hurt. You know CPS is present when you squeeze these things, and they really do hurt when the patient you know, starts to yell. That can spread the whole way down the spine. So let's say it was my shoulder. First, it will go down to the whole arm. Then it will go to my thoracic spine, lumbar spine, down to my leg. So the patient might say, and I'm sure you've seen this, it's my whole left side. Yeah, it's just my left side's crap, it always hurts. And when you palpate, you'll find, yeah, that whole left side was painful. The goal is to identify where was the primary cause, and where would that pain start, and then figure it out. Patients with pain pressure, reduced pain pressure thresholds will, uh, you know, for a shoulder injury, will report reduced uh, thresholds all the way down in the foot, in the anterior tibial lines. It's a really good thing to look at, and it really gives you an indication of on that pain scale where this patient is. Is it just a little shoulder strain they've had it for one or two days, or is this a deep-seated, you know, central pain problem that's going to be really hard to treat? So in the cases, in our case, Mrs. C, where she's got this, you know, horrendous pain going down both legs, across both buttocks, starting to travel up her spine. That's really bad. If the pain starts to travel up, that's another indication. It means that the brain is the one starting to change now because generally the pain should spread inferiorly. Where do you start? So, with this kind of case, 
this was referral from another chiropractor. So, yeah, that's another clue to your history, right? The patient who's seen everyone, that's never good. That's never good. We don't want to hear that, right? When they say, oh, I've always seen a physio, chiropractor, an acupuncture, I've had pain meds, I've been to a pain clinic. You know that sensitization has already occurred. So, where do you start with a case like that? I start, I always say all examinations, but virtually all, uh, nearly all, with gait. So to have a healthy gait, you need a good cardiovascular system, musculoskeletal system, strength, balance, endurance, rhythm, posture. You need a good visual system, vestibular system, and proprioception. You need a good sensory system, motor system, and good sensory motor integration. So anything that changes any one of those, those systems is going to change gait to a greater or lesser extent. So gait is a bit like having a good look at the wood and not just zooming in on the tree straight away. Have a look at the wood and then find which part of the wood is the problem and then start to look at individual trees. With this patient, when she walked into the office, she was, no exaggeration, bent over like this. She had a walking stick in her left hand because obviously that's not a, a stable position. Uh, as we know from the history that she says she falls most days. So when you're looking at gait, when it comes to an antalgic gait, generally patients lean away. So if it's you know uh, foot, ankle, knee or back on the left side, generally people will lean away to take the weight off it. When it's hip, however, often they lean towards. Um, it's just to do with biomechanics, it offsets the pain, um, it offsets the loading. So she's leaning heavily, heavily towards that side. Um, at the same time, you see a, a heavy hip, uh, hip drop uh, on, that, on that left side. Um, and she's got all kinds of crazy conversations. Her gait is short and shuffling and very wide based. The core features of gait, you know, because there are so many things you can look at gait. Um, look at the core features. What is the stride length? What is the speed? What is the, the width? You don't actually need to know the specifics. You have seen enough of normal people to know what normal gait looks like and to recognize an unnormal gait. So reduced speed, it has a high correlation with falls. So if someone walks in and you ask them to take 10 steps or as many as many meters as you can, if they look like they're shorter steps than normal, um, uh, sorry, if they go slower than normal, that's the highest uh, risk of falls. Um, shorter stride is the same. And wide base gaze, anything wider than 10 centimeters. So wide 10 centimeters, we know they have a problem with balance. You may not know why they have a problem with balance, but we know it's there. It makes sense, right? If you think of any of your back pain patients, your you know, your real acute pain, pain acute back pain patients, they don't just stride into the room, you know, and look healthy like they're striding on the on the on the morelands. They they look like they're in pain. That's basically what you're looking at for the core features. Reduce speed, reduce stride length wide base. On examination for her, those pain pressure thresholds were so severe that just running your thumb, no um, exaggeration, just running your thumb along her skin was painful. She has a massive scar from where she had that total hip replacement. So despite the fact the surgeon obviously did a great job and it was complete success, you could be the best surgeon in the world and even if you're using keyhole surgery, you still have to punch it through skin. There's nerves everywhere. So with her history of chronic hip pain and abusive relationship uh, to children who, um, yeah, for those who have kids, we know that's stressful enough, right? So for someone in that situation, any activation of pain is going to is going to risk amplifying. So normally, what happens? is you're, you have descending inhibition of pain. If you were to look at a, say like a section of the spinal cord, let's say L5, the number of inhibitory pain synapses to the rate to the number of um, um, excitatory pain synapses, it would be inhib inhibition to pain. There's a massive ratio difference there. Your brain basically is always saying, I don't want to know. And this is serious. Don't tell me about it. Don't tell me every time I take a step, you know, on a slightly uneven surface that's painful. I don't want to know about that. I want to know what the other sensations are like. I want to create healthy movements and pain interferes with that. So let's inhibit pain until it's really serious. 
what's going to be happening with these central pain sensitizations so that ratio starts to drastically change. I've not seen any, any research that says that ever reverses because that would be just horrendous, but the ratio dramatically reduces. So the number of inhibit inhibitory cells massively drops and at the same time the number of excitatory cells increases. Um, so for, for this poor patient, it means as soon as you, you know, best version of the world, as soon as you cut through that skin, you're bombarding the dorsal horn, dorsal, uh, horn with more pain, and that's a system that's good to go. So that slight injury, bang, that pain shoots up to the spinal cord, up to the brainstem, up into the brain to tell she, she's suffering. But it wasn't keyhole surgery, it was a total hip replacement. So he's also had to cut through all kinds of muscles, uh, and a whole bunch of other nerves. You often see around scar tissue that it's incredibly painful, and if you ever feel it feels quite nodular, what you're often feeling then is, is literally neuromas. So where these little peripheral nerves were passing through the skin or muscle, where the surgeons have to cut through them, you get a complete transection of the nerve, which results in a neuroma. So a neurotonesis, which doesn't normally recover very well, especially if you've got a lot of scar tissue in front of it. But that neuroma itself becomes very, very painful. So that's why even just running my thumb along her, along her skin is severe pain, you know, nine, nine out of 10, just for something as simple as that. So that's the primary cause of the pain. When we look down the rest of the leg, all of it hurts, not as severe as that, that primary, but everything else, you know, even the sole of her foot is enough to get her to, to have a withdrawal reflex, you know, or pull her leg away from you. So we know that that pain system is super, super angry and it's really re-aggravated. So in terms of treatment, where do you start? If I can't even touch her skin without causing her severe pain, and the last thing I want to do is amplify that. You know, I don't want to do anything that's going to produce more um, uh, neurological, cellular, genetic changes that when she leaves my office the next two or three days, she's still sensitizing. So where do you start? Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, I borrowed this from, from Ulrich Sandstrom, um, which is calm things down, build things up. So, in that case, where she's so sensitive, the place to start is with one of your with your laser. You, know, you, you can reduce pain without even touching the patient. That's why I got one in the first place. I had a few cases like this where they failed every other treatment, and you don't want to be the next guy on that list of failures. So um, the way I use it is I know the dorsal horn of the spinal cord has changed. It's not healthy. Uh, it's promoting pain way too much, and the inhib inhib inhibitory synapses are just not firing very well. Don't have the strength in numbers, um, and maybe don't even have the, the, the health to do that. So you can do it a few different ways. I would put it uh, on, on the dermatome setting. Um, and then basically, if this is my spinal cord, you've got options. You can either paint up and down, or you can do this, or um, for some patients who it's important that they, they feel your, you know, some patients want to know that you're doing something, not just, you know, a bit like old sound, you can't feel anything. So sometimes with some patients who are a bit more, um, needy is not the right word, but you know what I mean. I'll sometimes just place it on the spine and the machine, if you don't have one yet, uh, gives you a beat. So it almost gives you like a count. So identify the spinal, spinal level, place it on there and basically wait for the beat and then I'll move it down one level. Beep down the level, beep down the level, like that. I might do that two or three times. We're then going to change the setting onto either a pain setting onto a universal, and then we're going to come over um, over the injured tissue, over the primary area. So for her, I mean, my hand doesn't look anything like a buttock, I hope, uh, but let's pretend it was. Let's pretend that's that's her glutes. Um, this is out towards the trachea, and this is more out, this is more spine. And then we're going to move, and the way I'm going to do it is. It's going to be one, two, three, and I'll do at least five passes, but probably I'll do more like a minute or two minutes, depending on how severe it is. Um, if it's just primary sensitization, I will only do five passes and move on to something else. It's, the treatment is quick. In some ways, more severe, I'll do yeah, yeah, a couple of minutes. I'm a big fan of uh, pre and post testing. So what I want to do with her is before I use the laser is tell me, you know, how sensitive is that? Give me a number. Then use the laser and immediately say, and now. If the pain is reduced, then that's fantastic. Now I can do something else. I have permission to um, maybe try and work on those neuromas, maybe try and liberate some of those peripheral nerves. The peripheral nerves, basically, if you compress the peripheral nerve, it's going to become sensitive very quickly, but the blood supply to the peripheral nerve is very delicate. 
So if you have any muscles, any fascia, any scar tissue that is compressing that at all, I say liberate the nerve. What I actually mean is just get the blood supply going again. Get, get it so that it can remove toxins and debris, you know, get lymphatic drainage. Um, so use the laser first, calm things down, check that the patient is able to tolerate that. And then if you can, try and liberate some of those peripheral nerves. Um, if anyone has ever done the FNOR course or the uh, functional neuro orthopedic rehab, um, um, that's a great course for explaining things like neurogenic inflammation. So I would leave that to those guys because they do a much better job. But um, down on the hip, you're looking at things like the superior middle uh, pineal nerves. Um, and basically just learn your anatomy, learn where the nerves are, learn where they track. When I mean, you look at the scar tissue, try to think, okay, well, what, what nerves go through that area? Where do they start? You know, where do they leave the spine and where do they go to? And just try and try and work that area. Um, I would use, uh, in her case, we used vibration on that first session. So again, the vibration is going to be way too painful for that primary area. So we start on the secondary area. So I started way down on the foot. If you think that normally what happens is sensation comes in and it suppresses pain of that spinal cord, uh, spinal horn, dorsal horn, apologies. Um, so I want to drive things that normally suppress pain. So vibration, you want it very quick and you want it light. So you're not humming the patient's foot and producing pain. It should be a nice experience for them. So start on the foot and then slowly work your way up, up through the leg, up the derm tones, um, getting as close to that skull tissue as you can without aggravating the pain. So with her laser, um, try to uh, do a little bit of soft tissue work around those neuromas, uh, vibration. So that's calming things down. And we want to build things up. We want to activate the brain to send the sending it in inhibition. So the frontal areas of your brain that are to do with um, planning, problem solving, and joy inhibit pain. So we want to give her some kind of task that makes her think, makes her plan, makes her problem solve to, to get that descending inhibition and start to try and rebuild those healthy synapses and get rid of those unhealthy ones. So I had a lie on the side. We know through that hip drop and through her terrible gait and through the surgery that that glute medius is, is weak. She had a grade three. So she can hold her leg against gravity, but not against resistance. So I had a lie on the side and just lifted me up. No resistance because she can't do it. Um, and I'm aiming for a minute, but I don't want to feel guilty or weak or stupid. So we just say, hey, let's try and do 10 seconds. If you do more seconds, keep going. So 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And I did that two or three times. That's me trying to build things up. Um, that's what we did that first session because I, I didn't want her to react badly. Again, without exaggerating her gait, honestly, it was like this the first time when she stood up and started walking, she was, she was upright. Um, her gait speed had improved, it wasn't perfect. Her stride length had improved, again, not perfect, but much better. Enough for her and her teenage daughter to give you one of those, oh my God, this is so much better, which is just the joy, right? That's what we want to see. You don't want patients getting up and going, no, no, it's a little better. We want that. Yeah, oh my God, it feels so much good. Um, and to impress a teenager is always a delight. So, and that's, that's what we had. So she walked in absolute reliance on, on the walking stick and walked out, you know, laughing and, and, and thanking me profusely on the way out. That is absolutely a case where I think using the laser is essential. So I've, I've seen cases like that before where I didn't have the laser and I've just hurt people. And I'm not going to say I couldn't help them. You know, people, as long as you're doing the right thing, get better. But it took a long time and there was lots of ups and downs. And I feel like the laser, especially in cases like that, just gives you the ability to take a hands-off approach and say, I can still help you. Um, in severe cases, I might not touch them at all. Just say, that's all we're going to do for today. You're just going to come in more frequently than normal, and we'll just use a laser. Um, in the research, they'll often use, um, they'll often use laser daily. Um, so, but treatment is really short. So the patient literally comes in, you just check everything's okay, use the laser for a few minutes, and the patient's gone. So if you do need to get them in daily, it's not a massive chunk out of their day. They're not spending half an hour with you. My point is normally a half an hour. So it's, you know, it's a decent amount of time it's going to take to out of work. But if they can just come in for the morning for five minutes or the evening for five minutes, then that's not so bad. Let's recap. I, I tend to speak fast and I tend to get excited. So let's just recap on what, what we said. So primary sensitization is going to occur in all healthy tissue, uh, not healthy tissue, all injured tissue. Secondary hyperalgesia occurs 
when central changes start to occur. And generally, you're going to see it spread down through the derm tone. So if it's C5 originally, it will become C6, C7, C8, C1, and it'll start to spread down the spine. Um, equally, if it started in, uh, in, say, the hip, you'll start to see it spreading down the leg. You know things are getting very serious when it starts to spread to the other side. When we call it widespread pain, that's not good. If you were to say you look at low back pain, um, mild, non-specific low back pain will have a higher pain pressure thresholds than someone with severe, non-specific low back pain. Their thresholds will be higher, or their thresholds won't be as sensitive as someone with mild, chronic low back pain. They won't be as sensitive as someone with severe, chronic low back pain. They won't be severe as sensitive as someone with widespread pain, and they're not sensitive as someone with fibromyalgia. So basically, the more sensitive you see, the more central sensitization you know, the more harder that case is going to be to get better, the more clever you need to be about thinking about how you're going to go about treating them. Because there's a very real chance that you could make it worse. We've all had that person where oh, I went to see the car right down the road and he made it worse. He probably didn't do anything wrong. He hasn't permanently damaged them. Unfortunately, that system was already set to go and he just gave, you know, he pulled the trigger. Um, in terms of the exam, we just discussed that. Um, so treatment, calm things down, don't aggravate it, and then as soon as you can, start to activate brain and muscle to try and get things stabilized. Right, I've already been talking for, for longer than I should have. Um, I'm going to pass back to Rob so he can explain some of the um, some of the science behind why that laser can be so effective in these cases and, and why it's of use. Great. Guys, pleasure to speak with you all. Um, if you want to get in touch, please do. If you have any case, uh, cases or uh, questions, you can email me at jake at bcneuro.co.uk or follow me on Facebook, which is uh, BC Neuro. I try to upload cases uh, and uh, videos on a pretty regular basis. During this lockdown, it's a little bit harder. Um, so yeah, get in touch. Have a good day, guys. So, uh, Simon, can you pass uh, back to me, please? Thank you very much. If you're anything like me, then maybe you're one of those people who... Sorry, something went off on YouTube. Well, we could always continue with YouTube um, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and see what happens. Right, guys, um, back to me. Um, I'm going to try, um, if I can, to explain a little bit of why um, we get the responses we do from from um, from laser. Um, I think it was you, Jake, that said to me the last time I met you that for a long time, it, for you uh, as a chiropractor, you didn't really have anything that you could use to treat pain because you couldn't write a prescription or whatever. And now you have this yoke, you have something that you can use instantly to treat pain. I think that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the, the I think why I like it is it works in a completely me different mechanism to the way that we that manual therapy works. So it doesn't really matter what technique you use as a manual therapist, whether you're a chiropractor, physio, osteopath, or whatever it is, it's all working by the same system. So you basically you're going to be moving a body part. So whether that's soft tissue work, massage, manipulation, uh, dry needling, taping, whatever it is, you're basically you know driving sensation. Uh, and that, that's probably how we have our effect. Um, and in some cases, that's just not appropriate, in the beginning at least. So the laser gives gives me a window to, to still have an impact, but with a completely different mechanism, like medication does, but without the side effects that medication can, can bring. Yeah. Okay. That, that, like you said something that's very interesting, and I, I wasn't going to do it in this presentation, but it's very interesting. You, you said it gives you a window. Um, the, the whole thing with laser is laser works within the therapeutic window through um, cellular modulation and, and activation and mechanization. And, and the reason that works is really because laser pretty much, it works like a drug. But I suppose to take that further, um, it allows our body to access everything that we already have to solve a problem. Uh, to uh, make a difference, to change a pain. And the way it does that is the laser itself, as I already said, the laser is just a delivery system. So we're using the smallest amount of energy. Um, in, in the case of this device, 
uh, we're using five and 10 milliwatts of energy to generate a stable laser beam. And what we're doing is we're then passing our, our hertz of energy down that beam, which react with uh, molecular receptors within the mitochondria. In, in this case, it's cytochrome C. And when it reacts with cytochrome C, what, what basically happens, and again, remember, we're talking about non-thermal laser, um, what happens is it, it activates the secondary cascade. And that's where we take the um, adenosine biphosphate and change it into triphosphate. Now we get electron transport. And when we get electron transport, this then begins to effectively change the behavior of cells. And when we get that behavior of cells change, we get upregulation of different things. So just to go through the process briefly, we get the ATP. The ATP then causes a release in free nitric oxide, uh, which then goes on to create reactive oxygen species. In itself, when you put those two together, the effects of them aren't particularly welcome. But if we can then take that effect and pass it through the body or flush it from the body, then we take a lot of chemical changes with it. And that's where the release of H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide comes in. And as we move down this cascade cycle, what we actually see is um, upregulation, um, genic upregulation, so especially around the IL series, especially when it's in relation to pain. So we would see an upregulation of these therapeutic biomarkers. But what um, one of my colleagues noticed in Russia back in 2018 was that we also see downregulation and we also see a prevention of certain types of proliferation. So when it comes to pain management, we're actually working on the principle that our body has everything it needs to sort out the problems that we create for it and that get created within it. All it sometimes lacks is that energy. Um, this device gives the patient the ability to recover more quickly and to soothe pain by these chemical uh, interactions. So what we understand is that when we get these increases in nociceptive thresholds. What we need to do is we need to be able to calm that down. And calming that down is something that these lasers pretty much do um, very, very actively. And what they can do is they can actually stimulate the correct type of nerve traffic, which allows nerves to go back into their resting potential states and allows them to become what they need to do. But the main thing with this is it will interrupt the prostaglandic cycle, um, and it will also um, help with what happens with the acetylcholines um, around the whole mitigation of the pain cycle. Um, so as you can see, there is a lot of research out there in terms of how this works, why it works. Um, there's also some research out there about why it sometimes doesn't work because pretty much all of the time, um, these lasers will give the desired effect. And I know Jake's been working with them for a while now. Uh, I've been working with them for years. I used to be shocked and surprised by um, what these lasers seem to do. Now, I sometimes get a little bit shocked and surprised at the things that they don't do. Um, I have yet to find lots of things that they don't do. It's more so what they do actually do. So if you look at that last statement there, you can actually see lasers will cause basically production of all of the good things that we need in order to regulate um, and bring our bodies back to normal balance. So I think really when we look at non-thermal low-level lasers, the effect that they have is they, I don't like the word mimic, but really they mimic the effects of these anti-inflammatory drugs that we would, we would use um, quite well. But if we take the word mimic out, what they're actually doing is we already have everything within us to do this. So we're not mimicking anything. We're actually activating what we already have. And as we age, if you were on last week's lecture, as we age, our body's ability to do things changes because we basically don't have the cellular energy that we need to do that. This laser, these lasers, these non-thermal low-level lasers, they give our body the stimulation that we need to actually do what we're supposed to do. So the effects to produce that anti-inflammatory action, to interrupt that prostaglandic cycle, and to basically um, 
allow our body pretty much to do what it's supposed to do. I mean, we're all trying to get bodies to hemostasis. This is homostasis. That's basically what's happening here. So when we look at the positive effects of 405 uh, and, and 635 nanometer lasers, which are the, the lasers here that Jake and I are, are speaking about, like the positive effects are well recorded and documented in the literature. Um, I constantly use this slide because it pretty much shows you everything that happens. So take a second there to look at that slide and you can see all the effects that this non-thermal low-level lasers have. And this is a very interesting paper. It's, it's, it's a recent paper um, and it comes from probably a part of the world where God knows they need a lot of, of, of pain relief and they have discovered this pain relief basically in these lasers. So in conclusion, um, I'm going to ask you a question. And the, the question I'm going to ask is, is it possible that our bodies have everything they need for a happy, healthy life? The only thing missing is the inspiration to function. I think my answer to that question and, and my conclusion to this working with these lasers for, long, for so long is I have sat in my clinic and I have had patients with what Jake very well described, and I'm not a chiropractor, so I didn't have a clue that what they had was what Jake described in, in terms of this central uh, sensitization thing. Um, but now I appreciate that. But instinctively, because I used the lasers, what I did was I took the laser and I behaved in a certain way, pretty much the way Jake described. And I think if you have these devices, and I think maybe, Jake, you might agree, if you have these devices, you become intuitive with their use. And it's almost as if it becomes an extension of yourself. For me, it's like my tools basically are nippers, scalpels, and that sort of thing. Now, my tools have changed, but my tools are extensions of my hands. They're the way I feel and sense my patient's pain, my patient's universe. So for me, like this is an extension of, of, of my, my hands that allows the patient to basically experience life without pain. That patient that I had had suffered from pain for a long time. And again, it came from a very traumatic injury. She was cycling a bike and she got uh, caught between the tire and the rim of a, a double-decker bus and she got spun around and she was sent to us from the National Pain Referral Center in Ireland. And I think Simon would probably tell you, I'm not really a wussy person, I don't get too emotional that often, um, but I actually sat and cried with this patient because when we treated her, within less than three minutes, she didn't have any pain. And she had had the pain that Jake would have described for years, probably 15 years. And she didn't know how she was going to live her life without that pain, because suddenly everything had changed. And I think in conclusion to this too, the other thing that I would say is when you're assessing your patient, do everything Jake said, do what I'm saying, but also consider too the repercussions of how that patient's life will change when they don't have that pain, and are you equipped to help them cope with that change? When we look at Aconia, Aconia has been around for a long time. Uh, I think 22 years, Simon will probably correct me and slap me later. But these are all of the devices that Aconia has. Uh, so basically, you've heard what I've said. So what I've gone on to now is I, I, I'm saying to you, these are the Aconia families of lasers. As you will see there on the, the left of your screen, I have one of those yokes. I use that for pretty much um, neurological stuff. So we would treat here in my clinic, we treat Alzheimer's, we treat Parkinson's, we teach autism, we, we treat autism, um, ADHD. The second little device there I don't have, the third device, the uh, EVRL, I have that and that's what Jake has. The reason I have that is I don't trust a lot of the diagnoses that I would get from hospitals anymore. Um, I don't trust the reports I get from x-rays. I wanna see the x-rays and report on them myself. I can use this as a troubleshooting device um, to give me information in terms of what's not happening with the body. And that's where violet laser is very interesting, not just for treating the vagus nerve, but for other things. 
and moving through then i i basically pretty much have every one of those other lasers there i don't use them necessarily for what they were designed for but i use them um what i would say to you is the entire non-thermal low-level laser thing has completely changed the way i practice i think jake would agree it's changing the way he practices and for me it's taken me from a practice that was based when I trained into a practice fit for the 21st century. And instead of being the practitioner sitting here left behind thinking, how do I make ends meet at the end of this, this um, pandemic, I have tools in my hand that make me ready to um, treat my patients moving forward and everything that goes with that. So I'm basically going to shut up now because I've spoken for more than enough. Um, any questions that are there, if you would like to throw them up, um, Jake and I or Simon will endeavour to answer them for you. Thank you for so, listening. Thank you for that presentation, Rob. So I would say the, the, the way I think about the laser, um, I'm not as smart as you, so I, I simplify it. I just think of it that you're just, you're just giving the body energy. So any condition where they need energy to, to heal faster, um, then I'm going to use it. So I had I I like rock climbing and I I strained a glute um, doing a stupid move, and it was one of those real acute painful strains. So by the evening I was yelping every time I tried to sit down, stand up, rolling over was you know rolling over on the sofa was agony. Uh, and my wife kind of correctly said, I think you're going to be in a lot of trouble in the morning. It's like yeah, this is going to be awful. So I basically just lasered myself um, pretty much. I think I did it for two minutes, three times that day. So I strained it in the morning, did it three times in the day. Um, and I'm not going to pretend like I didn't use it and suddenly think, oh my God, all the pain's gone. They may be walking a little bit easier, but not, not a miracle. The next morning though, was amazing. The next morning I woke up and I just rolled out of bed. I, you know, honestly, was, I was astounded by it. It was amazing. Um, so something that I thought, you know, day two is normally worse. This is going to be absolutely horrendous. Actually, was really good. Uh, and I've had that with a, a tennis player spraining, spraining a calf. So basically any condition where you think, is, is energy going to be an important part of this healing process? That's, that's the case where I use it. Um, and that doesn't, you know, it's not cure-all and it doesn't mean it's going to make your, your, you know, it's not going to make your clinical life suddenly super easy and fix everything. You still have to think about it. I use it as a, as a powerful adjunct to, to other things. So I tend to use it at the beginning of my treatment to make sure the patient has the energy to, to do the rest of the treatment as, as well as possible. Brilliant, thanks for that, Jake. And apologies to everybody about some, some technical glitches. Um, you know, you troubleshoot as you go along. So I think with the video, um, what, we're not quite sure why it didn't work from Robert's laptop, but it did from mine. So you, you got to hear it in the end and I managed to expand the screen eventually. So thanks for bearing with us. Uh, if I can just go through some questions, guys. Um, this one specifically goes to earlier on, which I think was answered anyway, but I'll put it to you. Acute pain is not always the result of a physical trauma, is it? Question mark. No, it's not. Um, I think is the easy answer. Jake, do you want to jump on that as well? I, I think for me, it's an easy one. No, it's not. Yeah, pain is really complicated, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's normally... The, I mean, the majority of the time, right, it's going to be related to some kind of injury. So it's going to be, um, you know, a fall, a slip, a strain, a crush, you know, something happened to that patient. Um, and then there's obviously the psychological aspects and stuff like that. But yeah, the majority of the time it's something has happened, but no, it doesn't have to be. All right, thanks, guys. <clears throat> next question, and we can easily sort of go to Rob, then we go to Jake, and then I'll go on to the next one. Um, is it the gate that causes the pain or the pain that interferes with the gate? Or do you want to go with that one first, Jake? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in her case, because she was born with congenital hip dysplasia, the, just the biomechanics of that hip had never been good. Because the biomechanics weren't good, it was producing pain. And then pain basically, the way I always think about it is it's sensation in movement out. So in that sensation, you've got healthy sensation that's telling you about um, the strength of contraction, the, the direction of movement, all that kind of stuff. And then you have pain. Pain interferes with proprioception. So um, 
you know, movement is based on the visual system, the vestibular system and proprioception. Your brain takes that information, puts it together to understand where your body is, where things are around you and how to create healthy movement balance and posture. Pain interferes with that. So once you start getting pain in, um, you end up in this downward spiral. And that's basically what had happened to her. So she'd done a marvelous job compensating that over the years. Um, but yeah, as the pain becomes too bad, it changes their gait, which is very easy to see. And then once you have that change in gait, it's obviously going to create unhealthy loads and strains and stresses on, on, on those joints, which further promotes uh, a change in gait. So it's a, it's a negative feedback loop, is, is how I describe it. Does that answer the question? Does that make sense? It does to yeah. us, Robert. Yeah, no, it, 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 it makes perfect sense. I mean, I suppose I trained um, originally as um, a podiatrist. And I suppose biomechanics was a big part of, of what I did. And what I what I learned back then and what I what I believe now are are completely different. I would basically have said in days gone by, um, oh, the, the the problem with the gait comes first and 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 the pain comes after. Um, I think what I've learned through clinical practice now is there always has to be something to cause a change, whether that change is um, due to an injury or due to a, a biomechanical change. That will always create one thing, and the thing that that will create is discomfort, pain, and. I think the, the the very important thing there, and Jake said it, is pain interferes with proprioception. Um, our brain knows through proprioceptive mechanisms where we are in in relation to to, to time and space. So if there's a change in the ground, um, our, our proprioceptive mechanisms pick that up. When our gait changes, I would now argue that it changes as a result of um, basically a change in that proprioceptive response. And that, that will always be brought about by something. You're not gonna have a patient who will um, wake up in the morning and suddenly um, they have a bad gait. They will have a bad gait because something has changed. Um, I hope that answers the question a bit. This is something that you could talk about for, for pretty much ever and ever and ever. Um, it, it's kind of like the, the chicken and the egg, but I would go back to say really that um, Pain interferes with proprioception. Proprioception interferes with gait. There has to be some sort of deficit going on, which causes the whole event in the first place. Yeah, and, and you'll see patients. So if you if you look, um, if you go to an airport, which obviously you can't do at the moment, or you can't go anywhere and see anybody, but normally if you go to a place where you can people watch, if you start studying gait, you'll see that gait changes in gait are incredibly common. So. Um, I think the stats are 10% of people over the age of 60 have a change in gait, and that increases to something like half of 80 year olds, um, or 60% of 80 year olds. So, gait is so, so very complicated. And it's like I said in the video, you need a good cardiovascular system, strength, balance, endurance, posture, all that other stuff. So, you'll see a bunch of people who don't have pain, but they do have a change in gait, and it's because somewhere those systems are breaking down. Either the sensory systems aren't working as well as they used to, or the motor systems controlling move balance posture aren't doing so well. So you could see a case like that where she doesn't have chronic pain, but she does have, you could see changes in gait coming. Uh, and then you're waiting for a trigger. So she might get along with that for a long time, but we also know that changes in gait are associated with falls or a strong risk factor for falls. So if you can learn to assess gait, you know they're in that ballpark of danger, and then you're just waiting for a trigger. So it might be they trip over the, you know, the step, they hurt, they land badly, and then suddenly all the pain kicks off. Um, but yeah, there's a chicken and egg a lot of time. But if you get them before that point, you can actually treat them so that the trigger may not necessarily trigger. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's that's the kind of holistic approach, isn't it? So if, yeah. in my clinic, if you come in and you come in with, let's say, shoulder pain, but I see there's a change in gait, I'm going to treat both. Um, <laughs> Not not just hit that shot there. Exactly. Brilliant. Thanks for thanks for that, guys. Uh, there was a there's a question. I think it's in no, it's in Spanish. Uh, I'd like to thank our our Spanish customers for actually coming on the call uh, and also bearing with us, seeing as though English is their second language. 
Uh, he's just requesting a copy of this presentation and the video, which we will uh, send on to everybody. Uh, we'll try and cut out the slight glitches in the editing. Uh, there's another question here. Um, Jake, thanks for all the info. What do we as DCs need to have in place from an insurance point of view to be able to use the laser in practice? Uh, as far as I know, nothing at all. Um, so there's, uh, and, and Simon, you, you maybe know better than me, but I haven't found any research um, reporting side effects at all. Um, and I've, I'm looking at, the currently I'm doing a master's and, and the current study I'm looking at is um, low level laser and carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and I've looked at all kinds of systematic reviews, including um, uh, thermal, you know, infrared lasers, um, not just the low level. Um, and I haven't found any reporting side effects at all. So it's a bit like, you know, taping and stuff like that. It just comes underneath your, your normal uh, normal assurance. Simon, do you know, know any more details to that? I haven't, I haven't uh, come across anything at all. Yeah, I'll put my fourth pen forward and I'm sure Rob would like to come straight in after about his experiences with a company called Balans. Um, yeah, I mean, since our first US FDA clearance in 2002 for neck and shoulder pain, you know, that's what, 18 years, we've not had one reported side effect or adverse reaction. Now, every European country is different, but in the UK, um, it doesn't fall under CQC regulations because of the classification. It's a class 2A laser. Um, so there's no problems from that perspective, uh, unlike maybe class 4 lasers, which maybe some of you are aware of. And they're also dragged into the umbrella, some of them as low level laser. Uh, which is what we're doing a lot of with our education, not just in the UK, but around Europe, the Middle East. It's looking at the differences between what people class as low-level laser, because we have so many people that say we've got one. And then when you look at it, it's actually a class four laser, which is sort of infrared. And it's, it's. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it's just a different mechanism of action. It's a different delivery system. You're looking at heating and slightly less energy, whereas with the class 2A laser that we have, We've patented the line coherent beam, uh, and we found that was the most effective way to deliver photonic energy into the mitochondria of the cell uh, and to optimize that delivery. So from a, an insurance perspective, I think you could include it in your standard insurance you have in your practice. Um, most insurance companies would uh, take that on board. Rob, I know you deal with Balins a lot. Yeah, I, I think. Um... Unfortunately, we live in a very litigative society, um, and I think it's really worth checking out the insurance that you have just to make sure that it covers uh, non-thermal low-level laser devices. Um, if it does, great. If it doesn't, then we sort that out uh, with the education and training uh, because we, we, we've tied up with it, one of the largest insurance companies in Europe to provide cover uh, for this. So. Um, I'm not a chiropractor. I only know my my own insurance, but I have dealt with other people that are who basically would take a add-on um, bit to their policy to cover eventualities of litigation um, around technology like this. But um, to try and litigate around this would be pretty much impossible because there is no uh, recording of adverse events. And bearing in mind that these things are on the go since. Uh, 1964, 65. Yeah, initially for low-level lasers. I mean, since our um, since Dr. Rob Silverman came across and did a seminar on the 30th of November down in London, I know some of you on the call, uh, you know, um, attended that. Uh, there's never been any issues with any of the EVRLs or the PL touches, and I think there's been maybe around 15. 16 of you since then that have come on board with either the, the EVRL, the PL touch or the um, or the accelerate laser. So uh, I don't think there will be a problem. I'm sure if there was, Jake and our other customers would have told us. But, uh, you know, if it's out of discipline, for example, we had an acupuncturist um, who was into the, the neuro system. She wants to purchase one. Now, anybody who's out of discipline, Balin's come in quite handy because Obviously, through our training, we certify everybody to, make, to show that they are they've passed the training and you know they are good to go, and we can provide that certificate to the insurance company if they need it. So, 
Uh, I don't think you'll have a problem, but please keep that in mind. Right, so there's been a couple which say, obviously we can't see the slides, so we, we addressed that and sorted it. Um, how does laser fit into headache migraine management? Do you want to start, Jake, and then Rob can come in? Yeah, so um, migraines are super complicated. Um, the easiest way to think about headaches is it's all on one long spectrum. So you've got occasional tension type headache, say on like the far left of the spectrum, and you've got your chronic daily headache on the far right. Um, the laser, um, so some people are obviously worried that using a laser on your brain is dangerous, again, because it's such low energy and it's not heat, it's perfectly fine. Uh, the way I use it as a chiropractor, I will basically look at uh, nerve sensitivity for any of the nerves that are going up to the head. So anything above C3, so the, uh, you know, the vertebra C3, any pain from C3 or above from any tissue goes into the trigeminal system. So all headaches are involving the trigeminal system because that's giving you pain from the head. So the way I'll use it for, for headaches and, and neck pain, uh, for headaches and migraine, is I'll basically look at where the patient's di uh, pain distribution is, um, try to look at what nerves go to that area, um, and then palpate for any pain structures, uh, nerves, muscle, or any other tissue that is in that area. If I find anything that reproduces their pain or, uh, or refers into that same pattern, then I'll basically just use the laser normally over the nerves that supply the area, um, again, at the beginning of my treatment, and then I'll go on to do soft tissue work and, and the rest. Um, with migraines, again, we think there's a, an energy aspect to that. So it might be that patients, you know, migraines are so complicated, but let's take one pathway for it. It can be that you often see patients have a poor breathing pattern. So they might have that apical breathing pattern, very short, uh, shallow breaths, breathing in through the scalenes and up through their shoulders. If oxygen levels drop a little bit, so not dangerously low, but just into suboptimal, the brain doesn't have enough, enough oxygen to produce energy in a, in a healthy way. It has to start using a lactic acid, lactic acid pathway. And the same way that that creates a burn in your arms, it doesn't help your, your, you know, the, uh, the sensation in your head either. So we think that starts to become a trigger for migraine and then you get that cascade afterwards. So if someone comes in and they say to me, I think I'm getting a migraine, then I start straight away with breathing exercises to try and stop that. Then we use the laser to try and uh, help them produce energy in a, in a more aerobic way um, and see if that can shut that migraine down for them. Okay, thanks, Jake. I think we'll have to make the answers a little bit shorter. I'm, I'm conscious also of Jake's son and we've got quite a few questions to get through. Rob, have you got anything short to add to that? Uh, anything short? No. Uh, anything long? Tons. Um, I, I, I would just basically say, um, I I treat migraine. I'm not a chiropractor, as I said, so I treat migraines and headaches pretty much the same. Uh, and I do, I suppose I would do something that you would probably call flossing um, with the laser. And uh, we can get into that at another stage. Let's, let's move on. Great. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, I'll alert to this at the end, actually, but there's a, a webinar that we're hosting next uh, Thursday, 5 p.m. UK time with Dr. Rob Silverman and Dr. Kurt Gare from the US and they are going to be doing live demonstrations of treating certain conditions. Uh, this one, because we've received so many uh, suggestions for treatment, we're, we're calling MSK pain relating to the spine to include lower back pain, discogenic pain, stenosis, sciatica, MSK imbalance, rehab of the lower back core, cervical radiculopathy, chronic neck pain, headaches and migraines, which is why I brought this up now based on that question, uh, trigemital neuralgia and concussion. So there'll be live demonstrations next Thursday and we'll send invites out to anybody. Um, let's get through some more questions. Any research on cases where the laser do not, does not work? Rob, you've been using the laser since 2012. Do you want to say your experiences, please? Uh, Rob doesn't appear to be there. Are you there, Jake? Yeah, that's right. Here, sorry, um, I was... Oh, Rob, are you back again, Rob? Yeah, no, I was talking. I just didn't realize I was on mute. Uh, you know, lots of people would love to think they could meet me permanently, but um, no, um, th there's there's quite a bit of research out there on on, on why la uh, saying that lasers don't work. 
Um, I think your question there, Simon, was why they don't work, was it? It was any research on cases where the laser does not work. Um, I think when you see research like that, it, it the easy answer to it is no, um, there isn't. There is research out there that suggests laser does not work full stop, um, especially uh, low-level lasers. Um, and a lot of these lasers come from, um, I suppose, vested interest groups, shall we say, and, and and leave it at that. The body of evidence out there is huge in support of the benefits of photobiomodulation in relation to non-thermal low-level laser. Jake? I think th what I'm finding challenging with looking at laser research is that um, the, you're looking at different tools. So low level laser therapy is actually quite a broad bracket, it's a bit like saying manual therapy. It takes into account quite a wide range of, of different uh, uh, treatment parameters and laser parameters. Um, and that's, but it all gets classed on the same thing. So it's a, it, there are papers that say it doesn't work, but then when you look at the, um, the treatment parameters and laser parameters, it wasn't done in a way that is the same as maybe the machine that's that you use. So when you're looking at research, yeah, there's you know I've definitely seen research that says it's it, often it doesn't say that it doesn't work, but it, maybe they do a comparison, say like an RCT, so they look at a comparison. So let's say because it's at the top of my head, let's look at um, carpal tunnel and say carpal tunnel treating with an orthotic like a wrist uh, splint versus uh, uh, with a laser. And they'll generally say both are effective, uh, but maybe the laser, the orthotic was more effective. But when you look at the what type of laser it was and stuff like that, you think, well, actually, that wasn't a low-level laser; that was an infrared laser, or it was a class three laser. Um, and so it's where it's challenging. Um, so it's just about finding the, you know, research is always hard to read, but it's just trying to make sure that you, you're reading the right research and that the treatment was done in the correct way with the correct laser in the, in the correct fashion. Yeah, I think to add to that, I think this is what we're going to do, you know, all over Europe and the in the Middle East. And obviously, from Oconee's perspective, they have over 16,000 um, clinics in North America that actually have these range of lasers. And a high percent, percentage of that is chiropractic. Um, but over here, the biggest thing we found was um, determining or helping chiropractors and physical therapists determine what this laser is in the scope of low level laser. Because as Jake alluded to there, and we've had this conversation with Jake with his masters that he's doing and some research that he was looking at and he asked a question and it wasn't actually a, a true non-thermal low level laser. So that's why we've we've brought the, the, the word true in because the scope is so wide. And I'm sure Rob Sullivan as well, being a, a researcher and a scientist who's done plenty of studies, will always say like we say, we, we're... We have 17 of the 20 US FDA clearances given on low level laser. So we know what we're talking about. Um, what we do in the studies is completely different to clinical practice. A study has to be a protocol, a, a pre-agreed protocol, and everybody has to have the same treatment. Now, in reality, in clinic, everybody doesn't have to have the same amount of treatments that would differ between potentially one or two or up to 10, dependent on the patient and what condition it is. So we tend to focus, yes, we've got the laser as research, which is all level one placebo control, double blind, randomized research. It's the best you can get. However, when we do our training, when we get a new customer that comes on board, we base it on the type of things you guys are gonna come across in clinical practice. Because the research by that, yes, it'll give you the reassurance and give your patients the reassurance, but it's how you actually deal in 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 in, in, in your own practice. and. We've got a few customers of ours on the call here, and what we always do is we set up a WhatsApp group um, after each training event, and we hold your hands quite a lot through the first couple of months because that's the steepest learning curve. And we obviously want you to optimize what you can get out of your purchase, not just think, you know, I'm pigeonholed into using it for one or two things. You know, there's so many things you can treat, and we're just scraping the, the, the barrel. And, and again, that's also going to be a great question for next week's webinar with Rob Silverman and Kurt Gare. Um, so yeah, I hope we, we, we've answered that to you and we'll carry on with the education. So, 
um, chiropractors, not just in the UK, but you know, all around Europe. You know, we're the main sponsor for European chiropractic and world chiropractic. And obviously we've got very good links in the UK, but we'll carry on delivering this education to try to, you know, um, to, to try to fix the confusion that's always around there. Right, next question. Can we get a list of the correct frequencies for certain pain disorders? I think there is an Aconia book that lists this. Um, the answer to that is, we, it, it's not our book. There's a chiropractor called Dr. Jerome Rarucha, who's um, on the East Coast of the US, who's been using this specific low level laser since 2002. And he wrote a book on it. Um, obviously, we program the laser to treat specific conditions when we, we send it out. Um, but there's also a manual page where you can add up to 10 other conditions. But when you look through Dr. Rarucha's book, there are quite a few conditions that, you know, the, the, the hurt settings are the same. So if you look into, for example, you know, um, arthritis and you look into, I think it's lower back pain, uh, the, the hurt settings are, are, are the same. And no matter what setting you use, you will get a certain element of response. Uh, differing the individual settings is sort of like putting the cherry on top of the cake just to give you that sort of extra extra 10% efficacy. But we'll obviously go through this um, at the training program. Have you got anything to add regarding that, Rob? I suppose anything to add. Um, like, we have um, a heavy computerized system here. And everything we do goes into the computer, so we audit uh, quite frequently. So when I started with these lasers first, I would have used a lot of different frequencies based on what the book said. And I would spend a lot of time resetting the laser, um, which basically was a waste of time. So the reason it was a waste of time was we did a systems audit and we looked at the frequencies that we most often used with patients. Uh, uh, so we came up with this thing uh, that Jake alluded to there, which was the dermatome setting and the universal setting. And pretty much I use those settings for everything that comes through the door with the exception of brain we have different frequencies for brain um, the only time i will vary from that and i'd be very different to what the american guys are saying the only time i vary from that is if we're hitting walls and hitting blanks and it doesn't work then if we do we will use the frequencies that are regarded as specific for um, that particular part of the body that particular system of the body but other than that what i find here um and like we get through 30 last year we got through 38 and a half thousand patients across um 32 settings and and um three private hospitals and the results we get are pretty much the same with those frequencies so i think sometimes we can tie ourselves up a lot by uh, making things overly complicated. I like to kind of keep things as simple as possible. And if you're treating a patient and you're not getting the response that you want in the time that you expect, then, you know, there is me, there is Jake, there is a wealth of experience out there who can help you to treat what you're doing. But I think initially, maybe for the first year or so, um, don't, don't, make, don't make it too complicated. Yeah, I agree completely, Rob. The, 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 like I said before, I think I've answered a lot of the questions that are coming in there you know we don't want to overcomplicate it with individual settings uh, we send the laser out with a specific core of settings which are um you know will treat 99 percent of things now that cherry on the cake i keep talking to you about once you become more advanced and you become more used to it then obviously we can get more involved and, and, and tinker with you a little bit with with different uh hurt settings but uh for now I, I think it's important to keep it as simple as possible and uh, just you know grade the education and the training and, and as time goes on we'll we'll get more and more into that but that is covered with the um the training uh, there's a few more questions that are the same regarding headaches migraines um which we've already answered also frequencies um jake thanks for the info there's another one on insurance which we've answered uh migraine and headache which we've answered um Max was asking about brachial neuritis, rotator, cuff tendonitis, tennis elbow. Um, you'd probably, what, what setting would you use for the likes of that, Rob, just to, to, to answer that? 
like like I said when I was with Max, Dermatome first and Universal after that. Um, and like we treat those injuries all the time. We get excellent responses on 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 Dermatome uh, and Universal. Like the the one thing that I would say to this is when we do the training with you, there is a protocol. And that protocol is very is quite simple. It's it's dermatome specific. Um, it's uh, movement driven, and it's it's area specific. So what that basically means is when I treat a patient, first of all, like Jake said there, wh when I was teaching Jake, I said to Jake, you know, sometimes the patient needs to feel something. Stick it on the skin of the dermatome. Wait for a beep. Move it. Move it. The next time it beeps. Next time it beeps. Move it. Do that on the dermatome for um i would say up to th up to three minutes but uh my experience doesn't hold that out it's far less if you want to and while you're doing that you just basically try and get the patient to move the affected part of the body if possible so if it's a rotatory cuff they're going to move that or whatever it is they're going they're going to move that and then what we basically do, we do that while we're on the dermatome and then what i would suggest is then or what i teach you to do then is you go to the specific area of pain. So I don't know if it's if it's a tendinopathy on the elbow, tennis elbow, then basically you're gonna follow the brachial nerve down and then you're going to go to the, the pain trigger points in the area and you're gonna to go to the points around that to cause desensitization. So there is a very set protocol. Um, it works, as Simon says, 90, 95% of the time. When it doesn't, that's why we're here. Unfortunately, with a company like Aconia, we're the biggest pain in the bum you ever got because when you buy something from us, um, that's when the relationship really starts because we're there to support you all the way through. Um, we're there to help you get the best from it. And we're there to learn from what you are doing. And together we all learn uh, from mistakes that we make. And we also learn from the mistakes that we don't make. And I, I think really, um, that's all I could say on frequencies and what we use or why we use it. Okay, thanks for that, Rob. Uh, Jake, do you have anything or should we just move on to the next one? Uh, no, no, I think Rob did a good description there. I think, um, I think I said it to you before, but um, it's great having access to, you know, so we have a little WhatsApp group um, between us and you know, every time I have a question, I just send one over to Rob or to other people just to say, you know, is this correct? How do I do it? You know, we normally get a response within a few minutes, so it's, it's very easy. Brilliant. Yeah, we do tend to um, to answer WhatsApp at all time of night. As I think Max was uh, WhatsApping me about ten o'clock last night. So uh, yeah, we'll always be be there. And training is just important as the actual laser, especially if you're going to optimize the performance of it. But within a couple of months, um, as I think everybody has actually bought one over the last three four months. They provided us with a testimonial saying they don't know how they got by without it so that's always nice to hear um right it sounds more likely that a client's assumption stroke expectation could be more of an issue rather than the laser treatment oh i i love these questions um we're, we're actually back here to a, a a a pet of mine patient expectations um and practitioner expectations in anything we do, whether it's a laser, whether it's a podiatry treatment, whether it's a dental treatment, whether it's um, anything, um, our patients have expectations. And, and I think really, I will not take a patient into any form of therapy, uh, any form of medical treatment, any surgery, unless their expectations are realistic and you know we can meet those um, expectations or go away some ways to meeting those expectations. The other thing that we have to look out at two is we're talking to you about these devices we're showing you what these devices do from that you have expectations um we have to manage our own expectations as well uh but i think if you have one of these devices then issues like that don't arise i think most of us have very strong intake consultation procedures uh, and expectation management so when you put a device into your clinic like this that becomes part of your clinical expectation management process. Um, I think that's what you mean. Hope so. Hope that answers it for you. Jake, do you have anything on that? Yeah, so I, it, I think I said it in the, in the video there, but it's a bit like ultrasounds. sounds. You can't feel anything. Uh, and for some patients, that's important. They, they want to feel like you're doing something. Um, 
you know, same with you know, some patients with manipulation. You could be the best manipulation in the world, but they want it like really hard, heavy crack. They don't want a lovely, gentle thing. They want they want they have the expectation of what it should or shouldn't be. Um, and that, that can be challenging with laser because they don't feel anything. Um, so you just have to really stress that's perfectly normal. This is and just explain simply what the what the, the rationale of why you're using it. Some patients absolutely love it. Um, and yeah, so that's important. And yeah, you're right, for your own expectations of, of results, like I said earlier, it's not a cure-all. So it's not like you can just shine on anything and all symptoms just immediately disappear. You're providing the system with more energy so it can heal at its optimum rate. So if that's a, a 70-year-old patient, they're not gonna heal at the same speed that a 20-year-old would. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an adjunct to everything you do and it sets you up for getting the best uh, I think it sets you up for getting the best response that you're likely to get with that patient. No, I, I agree with that, Jake. And, and again, as, as we say constantly in our, our US chiropractors say that it's not replacing what you already do. It's um, giving you an adjunct therapy um, to actually increase the efficacy of what you do. Um, but also, as Jake alluded to before, um, with some patients who can't be touched or some complex cases, then, you know, you can hold the laser onto the skin. You can hold it two, three, four, five inches away from the skin to, to scan it down a specific area. Um, but it, it's, it, it's to do with the, the, the photochemical dose that we're actually delivering into the mitochondria um, of the body. And as Rob perfectly said before, it's just trying to give us uh, or, or patients the ability to actually fix themselves rather than it fixing it. The laser is just a delivery mechanism. And you wouldn't say that about others with regard to infrared, class four, hot lasers, et cetera. Um, you know, they're trying to cause trauma to an area through this heating effect, which obviously causes this fibroblast activity and, and tries to get the, uh, the patient's body to react. It's not a nice experience, but it can be effective in some cases. We're talking about a completely different delivery mechanism here. This is all about the energy. Rob said before about us using five, five um, milliwatts of hertz, 10 milliwatts of hertz. That's because if we turn that up and we introduce more wattage if we cre increase the output we'd actually increase the heat and you increase the heat you diminish the energy which is why as you start moving up in wavelengths of laser you get to sort of 700 to 950 which is like infrared it's non-visible light um they're delivering a little bit more heat and less energy whereas we're more we're all about the energy it's all about you know giving the body what it needs um, maximizing the dose of photonic energy so that's why we use extremely low outputs so that we don't involve any heat in the process. So I hope that explains it. I'll move on to the next one. Uh, we can all answer this actually, how about use on a child? Um, obviously from an Aconia perspective, um, our studies are on uh, patients between the ages of 18 and 70. However, um, I don't know any of our clinics that haven't used the lasers on children. I'm not sure if you have Jake, but I know you have Rob. Um, like I use, I use them on kids, um, quite a lot. Um, in fact, I, I had a child in yesterday, we had to use one on, uh, for, uh, an Osgood Slatter's, uh, issue. Uh, so I, I think like the way we look at the laser is, is important. Um, like the laser is a delivery system for photonic energy. Uh, we all, uh, irrespective of our age, in times of illness, uh, dysfunction or dis-ease, uh, need energy. Uh, so I really have no qualms, no hang-ups about using a delivery system to deliver energy to anybody at, at any age. But like, that's just me. I've been working with these things for a long time. And I believe that boxes are there to be got out of and envelopes are there to be pushed and opened. Great. Jake, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't used it on kids, but um, I don't do pediatrics and I you know, don't have them in the clinic. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't have any, I wouldn't have any worries about it. Yeah, I will just quickly tell you, because we've only got one more question to go and we'll wrap things up. Uh, in the Czech Republic, our uh, distribution partner across there is, um, has applied for EU funding and we've got to the final stages of this. Or providing our lasers into, um, into up to 2,000 schools in Czech Republic. And that's going to be used to look at things like um, ADHD, ADD, um, 
autism, uh, children with uh, speech and language problems, learning difficulties, uh, concentration, uh, stress, um, different sorts of sort of mental health type issues. So yeah, it's it's safe and we we should have actually got news by now, um, but obviously with the COVID-19 situation, a lot of places are shut down. So it's been put on hold until the, to the end of the year, but um, we're sort of 95% certain that we'll end up um, we'll end up providing that. So the fact obviously that the child um, receives no pain is a benefit. Uh, if you've got children who uh, obviously you can occupy them and, and while we're actually lasering them at the same time, other parents can. Uh, so as long as we're hitting the spot and we're delivering the energy, as Jake and Rob said, it, it doesn't really matter when it comes to age. Um, so yeah, that's not an issue. Um, let's have a look. I'm always more interested in the clients. I cannot help rather than the other way around. My research question is therefore not intended as a criticism. No, no, it, it wasn't taken as that at all. Um, the research has got to be there. We've formed our organization on the research, uh, but we always like to point out when uh, when people look at the research that when we do the training for the lasers, whether it's these lasers, whether it's the ones for uh, fat loss, uh, obesity, you know, onychomycosis, uh, skin condition, psoriasis, rosacea, et cetera. We always point out that it's different in clinical practice. So everybody seems to want to know a protocol. We have a standard protocol, but we try to treat patients on a bespoke basis. So even with the lasers for obese people, you know, we talk about the study was 12 treatments that might not need 12 treatments, depends on their metabolism. It depends on their lymphatic flow and, and, and you know, for transporting the fat out of the body. Um, so, you know, it, it's just pointing out that the research is great. It's what we've formed our name on because of the quality of the research. But in reality, in clinic, we've just got to be a little bit more open minded. And we look at, as you quite rightly said with your question, uh, with the patients as an individual and we tailor a program specifically for them. So I hope that has answered your question. One last one, guys, before we go. Uh, and your son is doing very well, Jake, to, to remain asleep during this. Um, can you mention the name of that research project again? Would love to look further into it. I'm not quite sure what research project um, this gentleman is asking about. Um, we will be sending uh, an email out to everybody with a recording of the video. It may take a little bit longer because I would like to edit out the glitches at the start. Uh, so when you receive that email, if you could potentially reply to it, um, it comes from a, uh, inquiries at aconiaeurope.co.uk, uh, sorry, .com. So please don't think it's junk. It's actually uh, showing a uh, recording of this video and it gives you an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to email back and ask any questions. Oh, sorry, the, the, the gentleman, yeah, the Czech Republic one. It, it was... Uh, I mean, Rob worked very closely with the partner in the Czech Republic and put across and helped him produce the business plan based on the research. Um, Rob, do you want to go into what type of thing you actually looked at when you provided Radco with the, the necessary information to, to propose it to the schools? I suppose there isn't um, so much to, to go into in terms of... Um, Everything that we do really is research driven and and evidence based. And I think what we had to do with that particular project was we had to look at the research, first of all. Then we had to assess and find out was there a need for this particular type of technology in that environment? And, and if so, what was the rationale for that? Uh, and then when we had done that, we had to look for research to support our our, our argument um, for that project and a lot of it comes down to the recent study that was done using this particular type of lasers into autism and where the project began to kick off from was resource management within schools in terms of can we better use resources and resource management if we can um, assist a child to become more um, more able to um, assess and learn and to uh, control um, areas of lack of, of concentration. 
So the whole project really is driven to see is there a benefit by applying this technology to children at a certain age in order to allow them to learn better? Uh, and again, based on the evidence and based on the research. In terms of sharing the projects, it's still an active project. Uh, we are still in the protest, process of uh, protocolization for it. So uh, there isn't really anything there to share at the moment other than the underlying underpinning research. Actually, on that, um, Joe, uh, we have uh, published articles on um, autism and also um, on Parkinson's, uh, which was done quite a long time ago. Now, the way the FDA works in the US, it's different to Europe, even though Europe is changing with the MDR regulations coming in, uh, which have been delayed a year, actually, because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, the Americans are in the US, you can't promote anything unless you've got a study to back up what you're saying, which has always been a little bit different to Europe. We obviously abide by that, but we can promote something based on the experiences of our customers and of our doctors. So, for example, if Jake or, or Rob or Max or any of our, our guys could say, look, you know, we've had an experience treating this patient for that disorder, we can say, well, as a conia, we can't promote that because we haven't actually got the studies uh, to, to say that, but um, but we can promote them saying it. So it's just like it's a little bit of a different makeup across here. So I'm more than happy to share the autism and the um, and the Parkinson's article. When it comes to the work we're doing on Alzheimer's at the minute, as you can imagine, these research projects have to be over a specific period of time. It's not something that you can uh, do and, and, and research for six months. So it's a good two years plus project. And like a lot of it, you know, we're not saying we can cure Alzheimer's, we're not saying we can cure Parkinson's or autism. But what we're saying is by giving the, the body the power to actually respond better to these conditions, uh, the patient can potentially have a better quality of life. And I think that's important, especially with the likes of the Alzheimer's uh, situation. I mean, my own daughter has, is on the autistic spectrum and I, uh, she's 15 now. And when she comes over, I give her a treatment on the brain. Um, even though I'm not a clinician, obviously running the company, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, Rob told me a protocol to use. And what I tend to find with her, she's less anxious. Um, she doesn't get stressed out as much. So rather than receiving the text message from her when she's at her mum's house, uh, which I'm divorced, which is, dad, when are we coming to yours? Dad, when are we coming to yours? And that's repeated maybe every half hour until I answer, because I can't answer straight away. So when she comes here and I give her a treatment with, whether it's the Accelerate, the PL Touch, or the EVRL, they all uh, work very well. Um, she just becomes less anxious uh, and a little bit more, um, a bit more, you know, peaceful. And uh, yeah, so we can base it guys on personal experiences. Uh, Jake is obviously there to give his um, responses. Uh, Rob is. Um, Dr. Trevor Berry, Dr. Rob Silverman, Dr. Jerome Ruka, Dr. Dan Murphy, um, Dr. Kurt Gare, all of our uh, really experienced guys across in the US. Um, you know, they can all help if anybody needs any information as well. So uh, on that note, uh, we've kept you guys long enough. We really appreciate you staying on for this long. Uh, and I really appreciate it, obviously, from, uh, from Jake and also from Rob. So thanks to both of you. Uh, thank you to everybody else for attending. And in this current climate, guys, stay safe, stay well, and um, you know, fire any questions across to us, and we'll do our best. But uh, we'll send an invitation out uh, pretty soon, probably by the end of today, to the webinar, which should be 5 p.m. Uh, Thursday, the 14th of May, which is an, an actual um, expert demo workshop treating specific conditions with Dr. Rob Silverman, Dr. Kurt Gare, Reason why it's so late is because Kirk's on the uh, the west coast of the U.S. in um, in San Diego. So you know, it, unfortunately, we didn't want to drag him up at four o'clock in the morning. So it's a little bit late next week. So I look forward to speaking to you all. And stay safe, stay well. Thanks a lot.